Hi, everyone. Nice to see this good crowd here. It is a huge pleasure to introduce Leila Webby uh, today. And I can't resist starting with a kind of irrelevant but uh, cute story of how I met Leila, which is around 15 years ago, I was traveling in Syria. Never mind, I just was traveling in Syria. And I um, uh, stopped someplace to read my email. And there's an email from this, um, this undergrad student at American University in Beirut. And she looked really impressive in her email and uh, wanted to come work in my lab. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, actually, I'm in Syria. You know, you're in Beirut. I'm going to be in Damascus in a few days. If you can figure out how to get there, we can meet in Damascus. And she said, sure. And so we met in a coffee house in Damascus. Uh, in this incredibly magnificent city. I hate to think what's going on there now, uh, but we had just an amazing day uh, hanging out in Damascus and chatting. Uh, and lucky me, later the next summer, Layla joined my lab. Um, she did a bunch of fancy mathematical stuff uh, with my then grad student, Ed Vool. I can't even remember something about optimal Bayesian decision making, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, it was great to have her around. Uh, she then went on to fi finish her undergrad degree at AUB and go on to grad school at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where she did a bunch of machine learning and cool work with uh, Tom Mitchell, and then a postdoc with Jack Gallant at Berkeley. Uh, and then she was hired back at uh, Carnegie Mellon five years ago. Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so Layla's work tackles one of the most important, fundamental, and fascinating questions one can ask, which is, how is meaning represented in the brain? And her particular angle on this is to use uh, more fancy math, machine learning methods, and uh, artificial neural network models to try to understand uh, how we, in particular, compose meaning from not just the meanings of individual words, but how those words go together uh, to capture uh, more complex meanings in sentences, uh, and also how meanings of uh, individual objects go together in complex images. Uh, and I won't try to tell you about what she does. Instead, I will turn it over to Layla, whose title is Characterizing Complex Meaning in the Human Brain. Thank you, Layla. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy, for this great introduction. And thank you for uh, allowing me to work in your lab 15 years ago and setting me off on this great adventure. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Nancy said, I'm at CMU. I'm in the Machine Learning and the uh, Department at the Neuroscience Institute. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about characterizing uh, complex meaning in the human brain. And I'm going to talk mostly about language processing and other modalities as well. And just to think a little bit about the complexity of, of meaning in language, uh, we can look at um, this, um, this very interesting data set called the Winogram Schema Challenge. Uh, so um, this was developed as basically a task for NLP models to test whether they understand language or, or not. It's a kind of a Turing test, if you would like. So you can read the sentence with me. The large ball crashed right through the table because it was made of styrofoam. And if I ask you what was made of styrofoam, was it the ball or the table? Uh, maybe you can do this. OK, was it the ball? Uh, who thinks it was the table that was made of styrofoam? OK, most people do. Uh, so you solved this correctly. Um, you passed the Turing test. Um, and uh, if you look, on the other hand, at this sentence, the large ball crashed right through the table because it was made of iron. Um, and we ask what was made of iron. Most of you would say the ball. Um, so let's think of what you need to do in order to understand the sentence and do correct pronoun, uh, pronoun resolu uh, reference resolution. So in order to know exactly what the word it means. Um, you have to first, of course, understand the meaning of those individual words and um, basically the syntactic structure of the sentence, how it's combined together. But then you also need to remember the properties of balls and tables, and you need to also maybe do some visualization. So really, it's a lot of really complex stuff. And you can recruit many other modalities um, or many other cognitive modalities other than language per se, um, like reasoning or uh, maybe some uh, imagination, things like that. Um, and 
we are actually still very far from a computational model of language processing that can tell us exactly what are the operations that the brain does in order to solve something like that. And when I say a computational model of language processing, I think of something like what we have in vision. Now, of course, in vision, we're very far from understanding everything that's going on, but we do have a good working model of what the individual neurons in different parts, uh, like for example, in the retina or V1, V2, like what are they exactly doing? What kind of representations do they have? And how do they compute them? And how do they pass them to the other regions upstream? But in language, the field is very different, mostly because we don't have good animal models of language or any animal, any true animal models of language. Um, and so we do know um, which areas are involved in language processing, but we don't know exactly how these areas are connected or how they pass information between each other. We also don't know exactly what is, the, uh, co what, what is exactly what they are representing, what is the code. I mean, we, there are definitely many theories or many models out there that say at a course level what function is processed where, like what function like syntax or semantics, but we don't really know like what are the neurons doing, so what are the edge detectors, uh, an analog, the analog of the edge detectors in the domain of language, and how does a neuron compute them. And so, um, so we still have to, to find out, like we still have to answer this question, how does the brain compute and represent complex meaning. But also a reminder is that with the models, with the methods we have, like non-invasive brain imaging um, and mostly human participants, we can't really answer how that easily. Most of the time, we're basically still answering questions like where, when, and what is being represented. Okay, so let's just start with kind of a, a first level question, um, which actually is still, was still not resolved. Um, so once you have a sentence and you actually understand that sentence, so you generate new meaning by understanding the sentence, where does this meaning go? Where is it represented? And uh, until recently, this was still unclear. It was suggested to be the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, by Lina Pilkanen, uh, but it was still unclear. Like, I mean, a lot of people have studied composition in neuroscience, mostly studying basically when do those operations happen, uh, where do they happen? But what about like the, actually the new representation that emerges after you do the composition? That was still unclear. Um, so, okay, we're gonna focus on that question for now. Um, so specifically, where is this complex meaning represented? And I'm gonna just simplify it into a set of binary questions uh, so that we can keep a track of them during the talk. Okay, so um, let's assume you, you understand a sentence and you generate a new meaning by understanding it. Is this new meaning going to be stored in the same regions as the more simple meanings, like the, simple, the meaning of the individual words? So you might think yes. It's, just, it's not like a different meaning of nature. It's just something you just generated. You use the same machinery to represent it. Or you can think that no, maybe there's some sort of hierarchical um, meaning that you're building where like, other regions are representing the more complex meaning. Now, in order to, to design an experiment to study this complex meaning, uh, you need to start, you choose your modality. So does it matter which recording modality uh, you're going to choose to study this complex meaning? Like does it, you, you get different results if you use, for example, fMRI and MEG or MEG. And you can might think that yes, it matters because these different modalities are recording basically different, uh, uh, cons uh, different uh, aspects of uh, brain activity. Um, and so they might tell you really different information about meaning composition. Or you can think that no, I mean, of course they're recording different aspects, but it is still the underlying, the same underlying process. So whatever you decode, you get from these both, these two modalities will be very correlated with each other. Also still thinking about the methods, like do you need to always like approach the problem from a theory driven way where you define a hypothesis first and then you test that hypothesis or can actually, can you learn directly from the brain the relevant representations? Um, and so again here, you can think that yes, just you just need enough data from the brain and a good modeling uh, trajectory. And this is maybe like an optimistic look at the problem. Or you can also think that no, um, you know, like you can have a model that predicts brain activity, but actually many versions of this model, if you change them a little bit or you rotate uh, the features, et cetera, you'll still be able to predict the same brain activity. So it's unclear how much the ability to predict the brain activity tells you about the brain. 
Um, but let's assume you actually do this and you manage to learn some representations from the brain activity. Uh, would these representations, would these models that you learn directly from the brain, be useful for uh, other things, for actually building better AI systems? And here again, the optimistic view is that yes. The brain is um, the only system that understands language. Uh, and so it makes sense that training a model in the brain will actually give you clues on how to solve, to build a system that understands language. And on the other side, the more pessimistic view is that you don't really have to, both the brain and AI don't need to approach the, so the problem from the same way. And so maybe it's not useful at all. It's just, you know, like airplanes and birds version of this. These are the questions we're gonna address. And so in my, in my approach, uh, what I use um, in general um, are two components. Uh, my approach is made of two components. The first component is naturalistic experiments. Um, so those image the brain while individuals process complex information. So um, basically, uh, I run experiments in which people are reading in the scanner, but sometimes also producing language, engaged in conversation, watching movies, etc. And the idea here is that there's no clear conditions in the data set so at the end of the, data, the experiment, you get something like a list of words and, uh, or maybe a, a time series of words and a time series of brain measurements um, that, uh, so you end up with basically a stream of these two types of, of, of data. So you can think of a brain measurement as just uh, a row of voxels, uh, where here every output is going to be modeled independently. And now, in order to kind of make this work, you also have to replace uh, basically the words with, with another computational uh, representation. Uh, and we call this a feature space. And so here, this is a very simple feature space. It's a, like a simple syntactic feature space. It's, it's just a toy example here. And uh, the idea is that you can annotate every point in the experiment with information in that manner, and then build a model that, takes, that goes from this feature representation of language to uh, the brain activity. And so this is called uh, encoding models. And so these are uh, powerful tools to investigate brain representation. So this is the second aspect of my approach. Um, and um, basically we replace the stimulus with the feature space, we build a predictive model, and then we test this predictive model on held out data. So um, in this case, if we're using syntactic features, you replace the text, the held out text with the syntactic properties, you use the encoding model that you're trained on uh, on, on your training data, and you predict the data for the held out, held out set. Uh, of course, your held out set would be much longer than just four time points. And so here, if the predicted data has nothing to do with the real data, you can't say much about that brain region. But if there's a strong correspondence between the predicted data and the real data, which is you can measure using something like correlation, uh, then you can make a conclusion that uh, basically at that voxel, uh, because you have high prediction performance using, in this case, syntactic features, this suggests that this voxel represents syntactic information, or at least information that's related to syntax. And so this is basically just a very quick uh, definition of what an encoding model is. Uh, now encoding models are much more popular, and um, you've probably used them or encountered them before. Uh, we, in my lab, we do have a uh, a few works on improving encoding models specifically. I'm not going to talk about them, but just uh, these are more computational works to um, uh, you know, know how to train them better or how to test them better. So I can talk about this um, later if someone is interested. Uh, and the idea, I think the most exciting thing about an encoding model is actually the feature space. So this is what allows you to actually test a hy your hypothesis. So with the same experiment, you can test multiple hypotheses by simply uh, changing the feature space. Um, for example, you can have very explicitly defined feature spaces where you actually design each feature space to be something specific that you want to model. For example, you can care about syntax or semantics or maybe ha more high level narrative things like what the characters are doing. Um, in another work, we also used uh, actually behavioral measures as our feature space. So this was um, basically self-paced reading times and eye-tracking measures of people reading stories. And we used that information to model comprehension difficulties in another set of participants that were listening to those stories in the scanner. And uh, finally, we can also use implicitly defined features, uh, basically learned from large corpora of data, such as, a, for example, uh, or most, most of the time, uh, we use neural network language models. 
So um, in this work, um, in, back in 2014, uh, we took a recurrent neural network language model. So um, this has a context vector that's latent. And from that, it predicts the next word in a sequence. So that's what a language model does. Um, and uh, it also has like a fixed representation of each word, like the word Harry here. And so basically, every time it's going to see a new word, like Harry, it combines it with the previous representation of context and regenerates a new prediction for the next word. And it keeps going in the same, in the same way. And so now you can think of um, a person reading these words one by one. And you can uh, think of how you can use these, network, these vectors that represent either the fixed meaning of the word or the meaning of the previous context uh, in order to study exactly these representations in the brain. And so here we used MEG activity in order to trace basically both um, how context is represented and modified in the brain as you see the new word and as well as the perception of that new word. And we see sort of like from the back of the head to the front of the head gradually, uh, in, like the perception of the word going forward, uh, as well as the, an update of the context, of the latent context in the brain. And uh, later on, um, in 2018, this method was also applied to EEG to study grammar uh, or syntactic processes and also to fMRI to study basically the length of how much information is maintained in different regions of the brain. And it's very exciting because since then, actually, there's been so much work in this area, including work, great work by people here, uh, very exciting um, uh, development. Um, and it's really becoming its own field. And this is just you know, a few of the papers until 2021, and there's much more since then as well. So it's really become a sub-area, like in the modeling, uh, using NLP to model brain activity. But I think there's still kind of, it's not, a solved problem in itself, because even though NLP models are a very promising source of language feature, sorry, are a very promising source of language features, um, they're still kind of constructed. I mean, their their forte is that actually, even though they were constructed without any linguistic theory input, they're still super good at what they do. But actually, that's a double-edged sword because also they're very uninterpretable. So if you find a good or a strong relationship between a neural network layer and an area in the brain, it's still unclear what that tells you. Um, and it's unclear how you're going to make scientific conclusions just by doing this, uh, this alignment. And I think a solution to this uh, comes from augmenting uh, your encoding models to improve your ability to ask um, scientific questions. And so I'm going to talk here about in this talk about two ways you can do that. The first one is something uh, we call computational controls. So my uh, previous student, Maria, and I kind of came up with that word, and we're hoping it catches on. Uh, but what we mean by that is that instead of designing a controlled experiment where you embed your controls in the experiment in terms of a, like a condition of interest and a control condition, you just collect a lot of data in, a more naturalistic, in a more, the most naturalistic way you can. And then you later isolate this effect computationally, and I'll show you very soon. Uh, an example of how that can be done. And another method that can also help you basically improve your ability, the ability of your encoding models to make inferences is end-to-end -end modeling. So here, instead of getting a model and then fitting it on a large data set and then later on mapping it, mapping or aligning between that model and the brain activity, you fit the model directly on the brain data. And in some sense, you, you learn the feature space that's relevant from the for the brain directly from the brain data. And then you can investigate uh, this, uh, uh, you can investigate what you learn and see what it tells you about the brain activity. All right, so now I'm going to talk about basically two, two, uh, two separate projects. The first one is about, is about language, so aligning natural language processing in the brain with uh, na natural language processing in machines. And the second one will be about visual processing. And uh, more specifically, it's about hypothesis neutral models of higher order visual regions in the human cortex. So starting with the language work, um, I'm going to highlight um, mostly this particular study, um, which was uh, recently published, where we're using these computation controls that I told you about with natural, natural text uh, to reveal different aspects of meaning composition. So again here, remember, we're thinking about the end product of meaning composition. So once you combine words together and you get this new meaning, 
where is it represented? More specifically, if you look at this, uh, this quote here, the little boy finally finished his pasta. You understand that the little boy actually fin finished eating his pasta, even though the word eating is not in the sentence, right? So this is a new meaning that, was, that, was, that you got to uh, by combining the words together. So we're gonna call uh, this new meaning, the supra word meaning. Uh, so this is just also another term we use to refer to the specific meaning. And we wanna know where is it represented? Um, so again, we use naturalistic imaging where somebody is reading, or participants are reading a text in the scanner. And uh, as a feature space, uh, we use basically a context embedding and a single word embedding from uh, a big language model at the time that was pretty big. Uh, it's no longer, I think, that big. Um, so this was from Elmo. And so when we look at these two uh, vectors. So remember, the context vector is representing all the words that occurred before the current word. And the word embedding is representing the current word. And we're trying to see where is a brain, where in the brain uh, do these uh, vectors predict activity well. And the areas that are in red are predicted by the context vector, and the areas that are in blue are predicted by the word vector. And the areas that are in white are predicted by both of them. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between what is predicted by the context and what is predicted by the current word. And that's actually not surprising at all because the way that um, the language model works is by uh, kind of computing a context vector that's most predictive of the next word. So it makes sense that there's a very strong correlation between the embedding of what's happened before and embedding what is gonna come later. That's by design. Um, and, but this, this shared information between the context and the current word, as well as the previous word, actually compl complicates how we're gonna interpret uh, the result of this encoding model. So what we're gonna use here is we're gonna do this computational control that I told you about. And we're gonna construct um, a computational representation of this supra word meaning. So um, first, what we do is we learn a linear function, g, um, that predicts the context vector from all of the words that went into uh, computing the context vector. Okay, so remember the context vector is predicted by, is computed by a, a language model that has a lot of nonlinear operations. But here we're trying to just explain everything in that vector that's linearly predictable by the individual words. And then we're gonna remove everything that's linearly predictable from the context vector. And what we're gonna remain we, uh, what will remain for us is just an embedding that has all the information in the context vector that ortho that's orthogonal to the individual words. Okay, so this is, we think of this as like the new meaning that's not present in any of the individual words, but that comes to us from combining the words together. And then we're gonna use this, so this is our representation, of, this is our representation of the, con of the super word meaning. And we're gonna use this to build an encoding model using both fMRI and MEG activity. So after we do that, so that actually effectively disentangles these two representations, we find that there are many regions that are still uh, predicted by information that's unique to the context and not present in the individual words. So there are uh, many, there are many areas that are predicted by the supra word meaning. And uh, once we combine uh, the information or the, we combine the results across participants, we see that in the language regions, uh, this is before we do this control, and this is after the control. So reliably across, uh, across individuals, both the anterior temporal lobe and the posterior temporal lobe represent uh, the supra word meaning reliably across participants. And we repeat this analysis with data from another lab from the Courtois Neuromod group in Montreal, uh, which is like, has, it's a different paradigm. People are watching a movie, Hidden Figures, and we take basically all the text, all the, all the subtitles of the movie, and we run the same analysis on that data. It's a different machine, a different modality, et cetera. So even with all these differences, we still get that both the ATL and the PTL are also uh, significantly predicted by the superpowered meaning. And this was also fMRI. But even though this fMRI uh, like the fact that these two regions were significantly predicted by supra word meaning in fMRI is very reliable. We see that actually when we repeat the experiment in MEG, so here we have subjects reading the same text as the first experiment, 
and we do exactly the same analysis, we find actually very different results. So here, remember that MEG is actually recording data at a very uh, fast temporal resolution. So um, we can look at subword processes. So here, we're recording a time series from every part of the brain. And you can think of the red line as the onset of a word. So we can really look at subword events. And when we look at the result, we see a very different uh, story. Uh, so here at the top, um, we see that um, the representation of the current word, the word embedding, is very predictive of brain activity, both before and after we actually control for the shared information with the other words. However, we also see that the previous word that occurred before this word is also very predictive of brain activity. And it remains predictive even after we control with shared information for the current word. So you're still processing the previous word when you're reading the current word. However, we see that if we look at the representation of context, so everything that happened before the, the current word, we see that um, it is predictive of, context, of brain activity when the current word is on the screen. But as soon as we control for shared information with the, cur with the current word and the previous word, uh, this context representation is not pre predictive at all anymore. So the super word meaning is not pre predictive of, of MEG activity at all. So you can think of the super word meaning as being a meaning that's maybe uh, processed more slowly over time or more distributed over time because you're building it slowly or at different points in time. And whatever it is, it just doesn't seem to be um, maintained using the same, um, using um, a neural process that actually leads to good MEG activity. So it's basically silent in MEG. And so here, if we go back to our questions, we see that for the first question, we did see that complex meaning is stored in the same region as more simple meanings, because uh, the ATL and PTL are also, or at least the PTL is really um, hypothesized to be the location where simple meaning or the meaning of individual words is represented. And we see that it's also um, representing complex meaning. And we also see that actually there's a big difference depending on which modality you use. Uh, so we saw that su the sustained representation of meaning is not visible in MEG. And this allows us to conclude that maybe the sustained representation of meaning is, is processed in different ways than um, you know, uh, ways that lead to strong MEG signals. So we know that, for example, the synchronized firing of cells um, is what leads to strong MEG signals. So that's probably not how uh, the superpowered meaning is represented. And I think also this has some, some interesting implications for brain computer interfaces. So if you're going to build a brain computer interface to decode meaning from brain activity, you're probably not going to um, use fMRI because it's very slow and very impractical. You're probably going to use something that's related to electrophysiology, so something that shares some properties with the MEG signal. And so if you cannot decode, you know, like more look, more distributed in time meaning, that could be a big problem um, if it's like totally silent in, in the MEG data. Yeah. So on the part that you said you subtract the you train uh, an encoder on the individual word and subtract that from the, uh, the contents. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you, do you train a single model uh, on like, maybe an example of contents and words? Or is it for every every single case you have to learn a new model and then subtract it from each one? No, we do it over the entire um, data that we have for this experiment. So we're... we're um, so the whole data that goes into modeling or training the encoding model is the one we do this uh, kind of uh, fitting a linear, linear model and subtracting it. And that guarantees that um, the variance that's in the super word meaning is orthogonal to the variance of the individual words. Um, I guess, but if you optimize, like, if you had an individual model that you optimize for every time you have a context and then a word, you would get something for each case, right? Because then you'd be subtracting the, you'd be subtracting the actual contribution of all the words to the current context versus like when you do it for all of the data that's kind of like an average. Oh, sorry. So I, I misunderstood your question. Yeah, so we do remove it on a sentence by sentence basis, but we learn the model to remove it over all of the, all of the data sets. OK. Any other question? 
to clarify uh, something. At which point are you expecting the extra meeting to be invoked? Is it at the, at the word posture, at the word finish? Or does finishing set up an expectation that there's going to be some additional meaning, but you don't know why? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, because we're looking at this data set in kind of like a, that's not really controlled for uh, by allowing, for example, additional space at the end of sentences or ends of words, um, we don't um, like it's not optimized to look for. Um, I would I would imagine like at the end of the sentences where, for example, some of that new meaning arises. Um, However, uh, because we, we are looking at basically the data at the end of the word, at the beginning of the word, the middle of the word, et cetera, if, it, if it's systematically there at the end of the word, it should show up. Um, but it doesn't seem to be systematically there for every word. Every word at the end of the sentence? Uh, no, um, every word in general. We, we did try to look at the end of sentences. Um, but again, maybe just this experiment doesn't have enough power maybe to reveal that uh, a more s subtle thing like, for example, at the end of the sentence. Th that would be a great next experiment to run. Yeah. Does, does, is that, does it? Uh, um, sort of. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, sorry, do you have another question? No, no, no. OK. I'm also curious if you would clarify regarding simple meanings. And I guess my question is twofold. One is regarding the brain. Why would we expect simple meanings necessarily be represented in the brain? Just looking from your plot, like some is like visual, medial regions. And then the latter, second part is um, the way that you obtain the simple meanings is based on the decontextualized word embeddings. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, do we even really know what these decontextualized word embeddings really get at? Like, could they be like correlated with other properties of the linguistic input or, yeah. Right, so I guess by simple meaning here, I do mean lexical meaning, so the meaning of individual words. Um, uh, this is just how I defined it for this talk, um, which, I mean, themselves, the meaning of individual words can be distributed and have multiple meanings as well, so that's a fair point. Um, just from using word embeddings, like historically, it seems like it can, it does correlate with all of these, or at least the way that words correlate, like the, the similarity of words together in an embedding, in, in, uh, in an embedding, seems to be very similar, in a word embedding, seems to be very similar to the similarity of uh, brain responses to words. So, so that's where um, that reasoning is coming from. But uh, maybe, what do you mean by uh, word? Yeah, I know that's true for like glove and other mm -hmm. like um, word embedding models, but these use transformer word embedding models. Sure. Yeah. Right? So we've used uh, we've used other models like uh, oh, that's what you mean. Yeah. So we've used models that come from simpler models like RNNs, but also words like uh, word embeddings like word to vec or glove or uh, things like that, and they seem to be doing very similar. Out the same variance yeah. 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 Uh, I feel like this is a bit better of a control because they're trained in the same way and trained in this, uh, together in the same model. But uh, yeah. So we also had a had a project um, a couple of years ago going in the other direction. So trying to use actually um, uh, trying to use natural language processing in the brain to improve or interpret um, natural language processing in machines. So the idea is that. Of course, we don't understand a lot about the brain, but we understand some things. And what if actually the way that a um, network maps onto the brain can tell us something not about the brain, but actually about the network itself? And so here, um, this was with, uh, again, my student Maria, who is now um, faculty at uh, MPI. Um, so here we wanted to say, to, to look at, for example, a transformer model, uh, which is made of multiple layers of self-attention. Um, so these operations are trained over a very large corpus to combine words together in a very specific way. And it's very expensive to train um, these network, these layers of attention. Um, but we wanted to know how important is this attention, even though it's very expensive to train. And is it as important at every, at every layer? Is it of the same importance at every layer? Uh, and so we started by actually uh, taking the attention, uh, taking the representation at a given layer, and just removing the attention and replacing it by, by just uniform averaging, and trying to see like how does that uh, like harm our, our ability to predict brain activity, and so this is like the average of our uh, of our ability, the average change 
in how much we're able to predict brain activity after we remove the attention from a given layer. And so every, uh, every line here corresponds to a layer. And we can see that, in general, the more context we have, so um, the, more we con the more words we consider, the worse we become at uh, predicting brain activity without attention, which makes sense. That's just we're, we're kind of messing with the model. We're removing the weights that it learned. And we see that we don't predict the brain as well anymore. But what we didn't expect is that actually for the first six layers in the model, we're able to predict the brain activity better by removing the attention. So it doesn't make sense at all. This is, um, again, you don't have to focus too much on the graph. But what this is telling us is that if I take a model that's trained uh, in a very expensive way and I just mess with it, I actually remove what it learned in specific ways, in specific parts, like layers one to six, I actually predict the brain better. So here we're like, OK, so why? So it seems like once I destroy the network in a specific way, it, it's a better brain model. So is it also a better language model? And so this is like kind of a bet in some sense. Like if you make a network more like the brain, um, it will actually understand language more. So this was kind of maybe some experiment we wanted to try. And so to do that, we used um, a specific set of syntactic tasks uh, that are used to, uh, to test whether um, a given model knows how to uh, knows grammar, basically. And so this is the base model that we like was trained was pre-trained before, and we didn't harm it. And uh, basically, these are the experiments when we um, we uh, remove the attention from different layers. So when we remove the attention from, for example, layer eleven. Uh, the model performance drops down, and this is, this is in sync with what we saw with the alignment with the brain. However, when we remove the attention from the first six layers, uh, we saw that actually we improve our performance in eight out of the, thir out of the 13 tasks, and we stay the same uh, for the remaining tasks. So actually, it did, it did pay off. Like We did one, win the bet in this case, that even though the model was changed from how it was trained, if we change it in the same way that leads to better brain prediction, it also leads to better performance on these NLP tasks that have nothing to do with the brain. And so again, this is a simple experiment. Um, it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely just a simple proof of concept. Uh, but still, it was the first one that shows that actually aligning NLP models with brain activity makes them better at NLP tasks. So this is kind of very encouraging into going into this era of like using inspiration from the brain to be build better AI models. OK. Yeah. Sorry, I... There's something I didn't quite understand about that, because um, essentially to get this result, you... So, so maybe I'm just confused. Don't you also need to train all these different models? Like, so, so essentially, if you already train these models, you can directly evaluate them on the data set and directly get an answer, right? So oh, these you... ones? No, these are not. Um, they're just kind of test. Uh, the, you don't need to train these. I think you just um, basically ask Bert to choose between two alternatives. Um, but don't you? Sorry, I'm confused. Like, when you replace attention with the linear uh, layer, do you retrain it on the language? No, we don't language? retrain it. Oh, okay, that's yeah. okay. That's why it's unintuitive because we're like changing. Okay, but even then, um, so I guess the the general question is: uh, here you're proposing, for example, let's come up with different variants of networks that can either be retrained or not, uh, and then compare them to the brain data find out which one is better. And maybe that's predictive of what's, uh, what's going to work on some AI task. But since you already have these variants, why not just directly, if, if improving AI is a goal, right? Mm -hmm. why not just directly apply them to AI? So you can just like skip the whether or not they improve the brain part. Because evaluating on AI is not the hard part, right? Usually oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So this is more like, a, uh, you're right. This is not necessarily the. You can take any model and then do these uh, these uh, changes to it and then see if it leads to a better AI model. Is that what you're saying? You don't have to go through the brain. Uh, I mean, here going through the brain actually doesn't. It's in this particular scenario, it doesn't 
save your compute, right? Like ideally... No, no, it doesn't save yeah. the compute, but it, like we wouldn't have thought of doing it if it wasn't for this experiment. I mean, that's how we thought, like we were just trying to like study the alignment between them and we didn't think of doing it. We thought about it because we were, we saw that weird non-intuitive thing, which is like an improvement in performance. Yeah. Um, and finally, um, I want to talk very briefly about this other work which, in which um, we tried to change uh, BERT, in this case, uh, by uh, fine-tuning it on data from, uh, from the brain. Uh, but before, I want to just kind of talk a bit more about um, one of the methods I talked about in the, in the beginning of the talk, which is end-to-end -end modeling. And um, I want to say that actually, uh, the classical way, like what I, what I was talking about before about encoding models, is not hypothesis-free. We always embed our hypothesis in the feature space. And so, um, even if we're using a neural network, um, uh, for example, if I train the neural network um, to be a language model, then that's, it's, it's uh, the hypothesis is it's going to, to generate um, uh, feature vectors that are uh, good for predicting the next word. If I train, for example, a convolutional neural network to be an image classifier or object classifier, it's gonna learn representations that are you know, good for classifying objects. So in general, um, this cost function that I use to train a neural network is what dictates my hypothesis that I'm trying to see, to, to, to study in the brain. So if we're always doing this, we may be adding a strong bias of like what are we looking for in the brain activity and missing something important. And so the alternative is to do end-to-end -end modeling. And so we can think of this as an as a assumption-free approach uh, to reverse engineer brain representations. And so what an end-to-end -end model is, it's a model that's built from the ground up without any pre-training uh, to predict brain activity from the input uh, from the stimulus. And the idea is that um, in, the, in the case of language, is it possible that by when you give enough data to the model, can the model learn to learn how the brain is actually combining these words together? And then once, once it learned that, can you actually interrogate it and see how is the brain doing that? Can, can it become like an in silico brain? Um, and would that allow us to extract some principle of what the brain is using to understand, uh, to, to understand sentences? And most importantly, is this even possible with fMRI? Like, can you actually train a model from the ground up to predict how the brain would, would uh, react to specific sentences without pre-training? And then go and look in the model and see like, oh, this is how the brain is doing this and that. And like, this is, these are the principles that are used by the brain. And so again, this is a bet because we, what you're saying is that if an algorithm is able to predict brain activity very well, then it must actually predict brain activity, you know, in like, under different cases, like for example, in a, metaphor, in a metaphorical set setting, it needs to know how the brain would react. It needs to predict the brain when you know the brain is surprised, uh, or, or predict the brain when the brain is, uh, you know, making some in types of inferences. So in order to perfectly predict the brain as much as you can, you kind of need to understand language. And so the bet is that by training an algorithm to predict brain activity, it will implicitly learn the rules that the brain is using um, to 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 work. And if anything, if this model is not better than, say, than GPT-4, which is probably going to be hard, maybe it's going to be more accurate in specific settings that um, models trained without uh, brain activity are not accurate in. Maybe it be more efficient, for example, or more generalizable to out-of-set uh, situations. And so in the, in the experiment we did um, back in 2019, we didn't have enough data to train a model from scratch. But we did take a pre-trained BERT and we did try to fine tune it on predicting fMRI and MEG data. We were successful in making it a better uh, encoding model. So it was better to predict data for new subjects and data across modalities, but we were not able yet to make it uh, a better AI model. And so here we're still, it's still inconclusive in this particular case, whether we can actually build an end-to-end -end model um, in the domain of language from brain data and whether these representations will actually be useful for AI systems. But um, we actually were successful to do this in the domain of vision. Um, so um, this is the second part uh, here I wanted to talk about. And so here, 
in the in the domain of vision, people have been aligning uh, the visual system with uh, with the neural networks for a long time. Um, and so here with um, Minakshi Khosla, who is also a, a postdoc here at MIT, we we thought of actually kind of um, training neural networks directly to predict brain activity. Um, so basically trying to see if we can characterize response properties in high-level visual cortex systematically in a hypothesis-neutral fashion. Um, and so you can think of this as an alternative tool uh, to uncover the neural, neural, tuning, sorry, neural and tuning property, properties in a data-driven manner and basically verbalize uh, what those neurons are doing or what basically areas of the brain are doing because we're using fMRI here. And so specifically what we use is the natural scenes data set. So you might already know about this data set. It's a very large data set of uh, almost 40 hours of recording uh, per subject, so which leads to 10,000 images per subject that are actually each repeated three times. So very good data, very clean data. And the nice thing about this is that these objects, these images sample a, a very large um, set of stimulus uh, with many different complex scenes, et cetera. And so what we do here is actually we train a convolutional neural network from scratch to take as input uh, an image and to predict the activity in different uh, brain regions. So here we, we actually focus on four ROIs, the FFA, the visual word form area, the, uh, the body area, and the RSC, which is a place area. And so for each one of these, er these areas, we're gonna build a different neural network that's optimized to predict the activity of this area from taking as input the uh, the different images. So we're going to see if this is successful. And, and it turns out to be actually quite successful. We do very well at predicting these different areas. We're very close to the noise ceiling in all of the areas. We actually do as well as uh, you know, state-of-the-art uh, convolutional neural networks, um, and much better than just categorical models. Uh, but actually, we do better than state-of-the-art networks in other ways. For example, our models are very uh, easy to generalize to new subjects. So you only need, you need like less than 100 images for a new subject to generalize the model uh, to that subject. Uh, or, sorry, even at 100 images for, for the new subject, you do much better than the other uh, models. So, so this is a very reliable model. It's just trained without, you know, uh, a, a typical not network would be pre-trained, for example, on ImageNet to become a convolutional neural network that can classify images, let's see. But here we're, we're skipping this pre-training step and we're fine-tuning, we're training it directly to predict brain activity from images. Okay, so that's great that it can predict well, but it doesn't tell us much about what it's, like what it's using, what it's predicting. And so in order to interrogate this network, we're gonna use um, network dissection, uh, which is also a method from here. Um, and so what this does is we're going to look at um, basically the voxels or the output units that predict the voxels in different regions, let's say the FFA. And then we're going to look at, every, uh, at a specific data set that is labeled, in which every image is labeled at the pixel level. And we're going to basically put that image through our network and we're going to see which areas activate a specific voxel the most. And we upscale that upsample that to be a, a, of the size of the original image. So here at the top, I have, oh, sorry. Here at the top, I have, um, I have the image that, um, in terms, like, like the image that's annotated with which areas are activating the voxel the most. And here I have the segmented image. And so I can kind of compute similarity between the objects that are in each image and how much, which parts are activating a specific voxel. And so I can end up with, for each area, basically the median, this median overlap, telling me which types of objects most activate each voxel. And I can see very clearly that, I mean, the results make a lot of sense. It's actually um, basically a hypothesis-free um, way to show how selective basically these areas are. So the FFA has a lot of selectivity for um, things like head, skin, people, uh, the body area has, cares a lot about uh, people, skin. Um, the RSC, which is a space area, place area, has a lot of, or the network that's trained to predict the RSC, has a lot of window select 
window preferences, which is kind of a uh, cute thing. Well, I'll show you in a minute. And the, uh, the network that's trained to predict the visual word form area um, has a lot of selectivity for signboards, uh, which is kind of cute. Also a very nice result, because actually the original data set didn't have a lot of writing in it in the first place. So the fact that we were able to actually have a network that has such pre uh, predictable uh, pre preference for signboards is, is quite impressive. You can see this, this data in another way. Here we're looking at basically the top category for each voxel. And we see that basically the FFA has mostly head detectors, the visual word form area, which has some overlap with, with some voxels in FFA, um, has also some head detectors, but also signboards. The body area, again, has a preference for people, heads, etc., And uh, the RSC has some preference for sky, but also, most, also mostly for windows, which is, again, uh, an interesting thing. And you see these results are quite different from uh, basically random networks that don't show this kind of selectivity. Um, we can see this, this result again in a different way. Uh, so here, for each of the, top predict of the top predicted voxels, we're looking at images that activate them the most, but also at what activates those voxels in those images. So very clearly here, the network learns that these, these images, like these, this part of these images are going to activate the fusiform face area voxels the most. And here, this is the word form area. You can see, again, a lot of signboards, a lot of writing on those signboards. The extra straight body area also kind of is activated by all these body parts. And again, now the windows. Um, I think my hypothesis as to why the windows are important for predicting RSC activity is that it tells you both about the layout of what you're looking at, but also whether you're indoors or outdoors. So that's what I think is, is happening here. Um, so again, the, remember, this is from the ground up. We didn't you know, have a definition of any of this category in the training. We really just trained the network to predict fMRI activity, and it learned all this selectivity automatically from the brain activity. We also interrogate this network in, the same, in a way similar um, to, um, to Bashifan et al. from 2019, in which uh, a, a, an AlexNet network that has a, another linear decoder that predicts the activity in V4 is actually uh, maximized to see which, which uh, inputs maximize a voxel, uh, so maximize a neuron activity. So we do the same thing here, uh, but with our human data. And the difference is that we train the network end to end. And so we see these are the maximally exciting areas for, uh, for the different uh, maximus act sorry, these are the maximally activating images for the different areas. Each one of those is a different voxel. And so you can see for the face area, you have things that maybe if you squint, it does look like maybe it can be relevant for faces. So a lot of concentric circles. Uh, for the body area, you have more elongated shapes, maybe looking like arms in some places. The retrospinal cortex, RC, has a lot of rectilinear features in, uh, in contrast with the more uh, curvilinear features for EBA and FFA. And this also makes sense. This is what we think these areas are representing, more rectilinear features. And the cool, I think the coolest one for me is the visual word form area, maximizing images, which are like, looks like scribbles, you know, like a figure eight or an A, et cetera. Uh, so I see all of these as like an even more kind of a stronger um, demonstration of how selective these areas is, are. But then I th we thought about it more. And um, we thought that, OK, we are trying to um, basically predict, uh, train a network to predict the FFA, let's say. If FFA is just responding, um, let's say, at level 1 when there's a face, and at level 0 there's no face, this is just you know, training a face decoder, that, or a face, sorry, a face detector, that will just you know, file, like, output 1 if there's a face, and output 0 if there's no face. So we're not really using the brain activity in any way. We're just using it as a, you know, like a set of labels for faces, maybe a noisy set of labels. So maybe that's not so interesting that we're getting this. The, just, you know, the face area is just a detector for faces. So that's, so like, if that's the case, then if I remove all the faces from my data set and I try to run the same experiment, then I shouldn't be getting face selectivity anymore. Um, so we, we did just that. Um, we did just that to see if we remove actually all of the faces from the training set, what would happen? 
So we saw that actually when we do that, um, we get exactly the same results. So we trained the network on a set that had no fa images of faces at all, and just images of objects that had no faces. And, and somehow, um, the patterns that emerge in those objects um, made the network learn that actually its activity would be maximized if it saw faces. And so these are the results on that particular experiment. So here, again, remember, there's no faces in the training set. And yet, the network just learns that these particular aspects of the image are the ones that are going to maximize the voxels in that region. So that means that even when there's no faces, uh, the brain is still responding in some way that's characteristic of you know, shapes that are important for faces. So there's like this kind of um, domain general response uh, to these images that are not um, just characteristic of one, one, one category. And we see the same thing also for EBA, where we train, again, um, the network with images with no people, and we find, again, the same cell activity. All right, and so very quickly, um, so we, we also wanted to see, um, OK, these networks are trained on these different, uh, different uh, areas that actually do different tasks. So once we do this training, do they actually learn to do different things uh, with different accuracy? And we saw, actually, that, uh, for example, uh, when we train these networks, or when we use the representation from these networks to do a face classification task, we see, we see that the network that's trained on FFA outperforms greatly the other networks. So it has learned from the FFA representation that's useful for doing face identification. We also see that the network that's trained on the place area, on RSC, also does much better than the other um, or the representations from that network do, does do much better than uh, basically the other networks um, at a spatial task, which is classifying room layout. So this is pretty cool. We actually, going back to our, to our set of questions here, we saw that, yes, it is true that uh, basically we can learn the relevant representations directly from brain data. Um, and data sets like NSD, which are pretty clean, are strong, are good enough for doing this. And what we concluded from this is also that uh, we found a very strong characterization of selectivity in a way that was very hypothesis neutral. Um, and also, we won the bet basically here again. Uh, and we saw that basically brain activity could help build better AI models. So in this case, oh, with this set of results, that's fine. With this set of results, um, we didn't find that uh, we do better yet than uh, state-of-the-art models for face detection or for face identification or room layout classifications, but we do much better than the other networks. So there's definitely a lot of research there uh, to be done. But anything, since I'm out of time, I think I'm going to stop here and, and just um, thank you all for, uh, for your, your time. <laughs>